In January 2020, it was cold and very wet in Twickenham, and we decided we would take a spring holiday somewhere in southern Europe where it would be warm and sunny. The most southerly place we could fly to in Europe is Malta. It's only three hours flying time from Gatwick. It's small, so we wouldn't need a car. And in March, the accommodation is quite cheap. In January, when we booked our holiday, the COVID-19 virus had broken out in China. By the time we went on holiday, it had reached Europe. So, of course, we didn't get a full holiday. We got two days out of seven. So this is the story of 0.285 of a holiday in Malta. Malta is in the middle of the Mediterranean between Sicily and Tunisia. It's a tiny country. The entire area is only about a fifth of the size of Greater London and its population is less than the size of Leicester. It's the smallest country in the European Union. Malta was occupied several thousand years before the Common Era and had some of the oldest megalithic remains in Europe. The island of Malta is in the middle of the Mediterranean and has several huge natural harbours. So all the local empires wanted to have a part of it. And over the years it was occupied by the Phoenicians, the Romans, the Arabs, the Spanish, the French and finally the British until 1964 when we let it become independent. Our flight landed at Luca International Airport and we took a local bus to Slima where our apartment was. It overlooked Marsanjet Harbour and the splendid view of Valletta city in the distance. Slima is on a peninsula which points east into the Mediterranean. At its tip is Fort Tigné which protects the entrance to the harbour. The streets inside the peninsula are lined with beautiful 18th century villas, whereas on the coast it's all modern glass and concrete apartment blocks. It's not very far from Slima to Valletta, but the bus journey is slow and painful. So we took the ferry. It's quick and the services are regular, and it's beautiful views on the way across Marsamjet Harbour. Close to where the ferry stops is the Fortification Interpretation Centre. Malta is fortified over the entire island. They've been building castles and walls and forts for the last 2,000 years or so, and there's hordes of them. If you like castles and stuff, this is the museum for you. I managed about 45 minutes. My wife and daughter managed something like 20 minutes before they scuttled off for a coffee. So now it's time to introduce the people who made the biggest impact on the history of Malta, the Knights Hospitaller. This was a holy order which was originally founded to care for the sick, poor and injured pilgrims on the way to Jerusalem. After the First Crusade in 1099, they became a military order, protecting pilgrims by force of arms. They became very powerful indeed. One of their forts was the mighty Crac de Chevalier in Syria. The Kingdom of Jerusalem fell to Islamic forces in 1291 and the knights took Rhodes as their new stronghold. In Rhodes the knights became a strong naval force and a thorn in the side of the mighty Ottoman Empire under Suleiman the Magnificent. He sent a force of 100,000 men to besiege Rhodes and after six months the surviving knights were allowed to withdraw to Sicily. In 1530, Pope Clement asked King Charles of Spain if the knights could have Malta, and he let them have it in return from Maltese Falcon every year as rent. After a siege by Ottomans in 1565, the knights built the city of Valletta, named after their master, Jean de Valette. It was paid for by King Philip of Spain and designed by the Pope's architect, Francesco Laparelli. The entire city only covers 55 hectares and is built on a grid pattern out of the stone that the city stands on. It is built in a Baroque style and is very beautiful. There is a complex system of fortifications and you can see here that a ditch was dug out of the stone and that stone was used to build the walls above it. There is a new western gate to the city designed by Renzo Piano who designed the shard but I think it really looks pretty unimaginative. Malta has two official languages, English, because it's part of the British Empire until 1964, and Maltese, which is derived from a form of medieval Arabic. 
Every day at 12, some men dressed as British Royal Marines set up a cannon in Upper Baraka Gardens. This was originally so that sea captains could set their chronometers so that they knew where they were when they were at sea, but it's now just a long-standing tradition. The same gardens were used as a battery during World War II, protecting the harbour from German bombers. We were having a lovely time in Malta and seeing most of the sights in Valletta and looking forward to seeing more. And then Josie got a WhatsApp from one of her friends in London saying that Malta had banned flights from some countries in Europe. We thought that England would be next. I thought hard about what would be our best course of action and decided that the next day I'd go to the British High Commission, which wasn't far away, and ask their advice. That night I slept very badly. At 2am I decided to bite the bullet and I went on Skyscanner and booked three flights home on Air Malta. The flight was at 5pm on Friday, so we had time for a last trip over to the letter and had lunch in the square next to the cathedral. It was a lovely lunch, only spoiled by some knob-end busker trying to sing like James Blunt. He was terrible. Our five o'clock flight was delayed by an hour until six, so that a hen party who had arrived from England the same day could fly straight back to London, the poor sods. It was cold and dark when we got back to Heathrow, and the COVID-19 pandemic felt very close and very real. When we arrived in Malta, there were only five people infected with the COVID-19 virus, but they were already scanning people with infrared cameras at the airport, so clearly they were very worried. The situation changed very rapidly, so we were left before we were confined to quarantine. It did feel a bit like getting the last chopper out of Saigon. Malta is only a small, but it's a very lovely place, so perhaps we'll go back one day and see all the places that we didn't manage to see this time.